Hello friends, welcome to our today's lecture on hypothyroidism versus hyperthyroidism. It's just a review video of what we studied in previous two videos. Now, in the case of hypothyroidism, it is seen that the patients usually has cold intolerance, that they suffer from cold. And whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism, the patient suffers from heat in intolerance. Whereas patients in the case of hypothyroidism has decreased sweating. Whereas in case of hyperthyroidism, the patients suffer from increased sweating. There is weight gain in the case of hypothyroidism and this is basically due to decreased metabolic rate. Whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism, there is weight loss and this is due to increased synthesis of Na plus K plus ATPase where, uh, due to which there is increase in basal metabolic rate. Also, we see hyponatremia in the case of hypothyroidism. This is due to decrease in the free water clearance. And the dry cool skin due to decreased blood flow. This is mainly due to vasoconstriction. And here we see warm moist skin. This is due to vasodilation. There is, there in the description of the hair, we see coarse, brittle hair and diffuse alopecia in the case of hypothyroidism, whereas fine, fine hair in the case of hyperthyroidism. Nails in the case of hypothyroidism are brittle, whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism, it is seen that the nail suffers from onycholysis. What is onycholysis? It is the painless separation of the nail from the nail bed. Also, in the case of hypothyroidism, we see that the patient suffers from puffy faces and generalized non-pitting edema in uh, comparison with hyperthyroidism where we only see pre tapial mixed edema in gray, and also only in the cases of Gray's disease, not in all kind of hyperthyroidism where here there is generalized, that is the, in the whole body we can see edema. And the puffy faces or the swelling is, all, is known as myxedema. And this is mainly due to increased glycosaminoglycans in the interstitial spaces. In the cases of hypothyroidism that leads to increased osmotic pressure that further causes water retention and swelling. This is the picture demonstrating onycholysis that we see in the case of hyperthyroidism. They, here we can see the nails being separated from the nail bed. This extra white portion actually demonstrates the separation and it is painless. In the ocular findings in the case of hypothyroidism we see periorbital edema. Whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism uh, we only see in the cases of Graves disease that there is ophthalmopathy where there is periorbital edema with exophthalmos and also we see lid lag retraction. This is uh, mainly because of sympathetic stimulation of the levator palpebrae superioris and superior tarsal muscle. What is the superior tarsal muscle? It is also known as Muller's muscle. It is a structural muscle which functions to maintain the elevation of the upper eyelid. In the gastrointestinal findings, we see that uh, the hypothyroidism uh, individuals suffer from constipation because of decreased GI motility, whereas the hyperthyroidism individuals suffer from hyperdefecation or diarrhea. This is due to increased GI motility. Uh, and uh, in hypothyroidism, there is decreased appetite, whereas in the case of hyper, there is increased appetite. And in the musculoskeletal finding, we see that uh, the Hypothyroid patient suffers from hypothyroid myopathy, which is the proximal weakness with increased creatinine kinase level. Whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism, there is thyrotoxic myopathy with proximal weakness and normal creatinine kinase. This is very much important. Please note this. And uh, next here, we can also see in the cases of hypothyroidism, the carpal tunnel syndrome. This is mainly due to glycosaminoglycan secretion as I have told earlier in the video of hypothyroidism. Next clinical feature that we found is myoedema which is a small bump that rise on the surface of a muscle when struck with a hammer. Whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism we see osteoporosis or increased fracture rate. 
This is because the T3 directly stimulates bone resorption. Bone resorption means bone thinning. Uh, so, if there will be increased T3, there will be increased bone resorption or bone thinning and it will lead to increased fracture rate. Before moving ahead, please remember that in the case of hypothyroidism, there is weight gain with decreased appetite. While in hyperthyroidism, there is weight loss with increased appetite. It's usually very confusing because we think that if a person is eating less, then his weight will lose weight. But in hypothyroidism cases, this is the peculiarity that even when he has decreased appetite, he has less intake of the food, then his weight will abnormally gain. Similarly, in hyperthyroidism, when increased appetite, there is a lot of food intake, after that, the weight of the weight is lost. So, please remember this. Now, coming to reproductive findings, in hyperthyroidism, we see abnormal uterine bleeding, decreased libido and decreased sex drive. Now, coming to reproductive findings, in hyperthyroidism, we see abnormal uterine bleeding, decreased libido and infertility. Libido means sexual desire. So, there is decreased sexual desire. In the case of hyperthyroidism, there is abnormal uterine bleeding, decreased libido and infertility similar to hypothyroidism. But one point added here is gynecomastia is seen in the cases of males, which means increased breast tissue. Now, next in the neuropsychiatric finding, we find that in the cases of hypothyroidism, there is hypoactivity, lethargy, fatigue, weakness, depressed mood and there are reduced reflexes. All, all the reflexes are reduced or delayed. Whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism, we see hyperactivity, restlessness, anxiety, insomnia, fine tremors. This is mainly due to increased beta adrenergic activity. As I told you earlier in my videos that thyroid hormones lead to stimulation of the sympathetic activities. So, if hyperthyroidism happens, they lead to increase in the all sympathetic nervous system activity including the increase in the beta adrenergic and the alpha adrenergic activities. Also in the case of hyperthyroidism, we see increased reflexes and the uh, description of uh, the reflexes being increased is given as brisk, that they become furtila or quick. Now coming to the cardiovascular findings, we see bradycardia, dyspnea on exertion and decreased cardiac output in the cases of hypothyroidism. Whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism, we see tachycardia, palpitations, dyspnea, arrhythmias, menis atrial fibrillation, then chest pain, systolic hypertension. This is all due to increased number and sensitivity to beta adrenergic receptors. Now, lastly, coming to the lab findings. So, in the case of hypothyroidism, there is increased TSH, that is thyroid stimulating hormone, if the condition is for the primary hypothyroidism and there is decreased free T3 and T4. With hypercholesterolemia, this is due to decreased LDL receptor expression, whereas in the case of hyperthyroidism, there is decreased TSH, that too if the case is for the primary hypothyroidism. Second, there will be increased free T3 and T4 and fourth, there will be decreased LDL, HDL and total cholesterol. Primary hypo or hyperthyroidism का मतलब क्या होता है? Primary में जो thyroid gland है उसके उसकी वजह से अगर hypothyroidism होता है, hyper होता है तो उसे कहते हैं primary. Secondary और tertiary वो होते हैं जब thyroid gland को छोड़के किसी और causes की वजह से, किसी और organs की वजह से या tumor की वजह से जब अगर hypothyroidism में hyperthyroidism होता है तो उसे secondary कहते हैं. इसका डिटेल डिस्क्रिप्शन मैंने प्रीवियस की वीडियोस में आपको समझाया है, सो प्लीज डू रिव्यू इट। दिस वाज ऑल अबाउट द डिफरेंस बिटवीन हाइपो वर्सेस हाइपरथेरेटिज्म। नाउ लेट्स रिव्यू सम क्वेश्चन। इन दिस क्वेश्चन, अ 26 इयर ओल्ड वुमेन कम्स टू द फिजिशियन बिकॉज़ ऑफ पेन विथ स्वालोइंग increasing fatigue and weight gain despite decreased calorie intake for the past month. Pulse is 54 per minute. Physical examination discloses 
tenderness on palpation of thyroid. Serum thyroid stimulating hormone concentration is 2.91 milli unit per liter. Which of the following histologic patterns would most likely be seen in this patient's thyroid gland? Pause the video and then think of the answer. Now in this case, the patient suffers from pain with swallowing, number one. Second, there is fatigue. Third, there is weight gain despite decreased appetite. And also she has tenderness on palpation of thyroid. Where is the serum thyroid stimulating hormone concentration is normal because the normal concentration range between 0 0.4 to 4 milli units per liter. So the thyroid stimulating hormone is normal. But through the symptoms of pain with swallowing, fatigue, weight gain, decreased appetite, we come to know that this is the case of hypothyroidism. But what kind of hypothyroidism? Pain comes with decurvain. So decurvain brings the pain. Another name of decurvain is subacute granulomatous thyroiditis. So this is the condition of subacute granulomatous thyroiditis. Now, how do subacute granulomatous thyroiditis present histologically? The name itself suggests that there will be granulomatous inflammation with multinucleated giant cells. So the answer to this question will be V, B. Now let us see this question. In this, a 55 year old woman comes to her primary care physician because of recent weight loss and sweatiness. On physical examination, her thyroid is enlarged, smooth and non-tender. Patellar tender reflexes are brisk bilaterally. Ocular examination reveals the findings shown. Laboratory testing suggests primary hyperthyroidism. Which of the following tests will confirm the most likely cause of the patient's symptoms? Pause the video and think of the answer. The findings of this patient like weight loss, sweatiness, thyroid being enlarged, smooth and non-tender, with the patellar tendon reflexes being brisk mainly, and this ophthalmology situation suggests us that this is the condition of Graves' disease and the picture demonstrates X of thalmos. So, uh, the Graves' disease being type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, it is it is mediated by anti-TSH receptor antibodies that stimulate the TSH receptors which can be detected by ELISA or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. In this question, a 53-year-old woman comes to the office because of anxiety and fatigue for three months. She says she has also had some weight loss as well as irregular period. In addition to this, she also reports occasional double vision and a greedy sensation in her eyes for two months, usually at the end of the day. She denies any fevers or chills, night sweats, nausea or vomiting. Medications include simvastatin and omeprazole. Examination of the hands and feet are shown below. A diagnosis is made and appropriate medical therapy is initialed. Which of the following adverse effects of this medication will require close monitoring? Pause the video and think of the answer. So in this question, the patient's anxiety, fatigue, weight loss, with irregular periods reflect a state of hyperthyroidism as well as her symptoms of double vision or diplopia and greedy sensation in her eyes may reflect grave ophthalmopathy. In this picture, her anterior shins appear waxy, indurated and edematous reflecting increased mucin deposition that occurs in pre-tibial myxedema which is a finding specific to Graves' disease. Her hands demonstrate a condition of thyroid arcopachy. It is a condition in which new bone formation results in 
swelling of the fingers and toes that can look similar to clubbing. Because of this specific signs like graves of thalmopathy and pre-tibial myxedema, we diagnose that this is a graves disease and the treatment to this is methimazole and propylthiouracil which are the thionamides. Now the agranulocytosis is a rare but serious toxicity of both methimazole and propylthiouracil Thus, the adverse effect that needs to be close monitored will be agranulocytosis, which is caused by the medication of like methimazole and propyl thiouracil, which is used to treat the Graves disease. They are actually the mainstay therapy for reducing thyroid hormone production during medical treatment of Graves disease. Now let us see another case scenario. In this a 42 year old male comes to the office because of recurrent episodes of bloody urine and blood streaked sputum for a month. He has also had fevers, fatigue and a chronic cough for the last two months. Renal biopsy is obtained and immunofluorescence demonstrates antibodies to the glomerular basement membrane. Which of the following pathologies has the most similar mechanism to the patient's condition? Pause the video and think of the answer. In this clinical presentation, hematuria, that is the bloody urine, and hemoptysis, that is the blood, bloody sputum, both of them represent the symptoms of good pastures syndrome, which is the patient's diagnosis. The condition develops via a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction with antibodies to the glomerular basement membrane. The finding of linear deposits of immunofluorescence helps to confirm the diagnosis. Now, of the choices listed over here, only the Graves disease is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. In the Graves disease, uh, the, this disease also results from an antibody called thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin that has a similar effect to thyroid stimulating hormone and thus this antibodies cause the thyroid gland to produce excess thyroid hormone. So the answer to this question will be Graves disease. A six-year girl is brought to the clinic because of swelling of the face and neck. She and her family just immigrated to the United States from Indonesia. The child was developmentally normal at birth but then developed progressive intellectual disability and growth delay. Physical examination reveals short limbs and abdominal protuberance and a smooth and large thyroid gland. She eats normally. Photographs of the child at three months of age are shown. Which of the following best explains these findings? Pause the video and think of the answer. So this is the case of congenital hypothyroidism. I request you all to review the previous video of hypothyroidism. And uh, the link for the video will be in the description box below. Do review it. And uh, the main thing to remember is that the congenital hypothyroidism presents with the symptoms of 6 Ps. Uh, which I mentioned in the video. Do review and remember this. Now the child here has a goiter as evidenced by enlarged thyroid gland. Also the growth and cognitive delay. Also short limbs and umbilical hernia. This all suggests untreated congenital hypothyroidism. Now what is the cause of congenital hypothyroidism? Mainly it is due to iodine deficiency that too if the uh, case is that the family here belongs from Indonesia. Indonesia is a developing country so may, uh, the cause here will be iodine deficiency. So the answer to this question is dietary iodine deficiency. Now in this question a 52 year old woman presents to the clinic for fatigue, constipation, dry skin, brittle hair and weight gain of 10 kg, pulses 46 per minute, physical examination reveals an enlarged non-tender thyroid and delayed reflexes. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Pause the video and think of the answer. 
Now the symptoms of fatigue, constipation, dry skin, brittle hair, weight gain with enlarged non-tender thyroid and delayed reflexes. All this suggests that the patient is suffering from hypothyroidism. Now here of all the choices listed, uh, except Graves' disease, the rest all the four can lead to hypothyroidism. So which kind of hypothyroidism belongs to the description of this patient? So the most likely choice is Hashimoto thyroiditis. This is because the Hashimoto thyroiditis is a progressive autoimmune disorder that results in primary hypothyroidism and it is associated with enlarged non-tender thyroid, fatigue, constipation, weight gain, dry skin, brittle hair, bradycardia and delayed reflexes. And, uh, Subacute thyroiditis is associated with painful goiter and there is no such mention of here of painful goiter so that was not the answer to this question as well as riddle thyroiditis was not the answer because riddle thyroiditis usually results in compression of the nearby structures for example it leads to compression of trachea thereby leading to difficulty in breathing. And there is no mention of such scenario here. So the, the riddle thyroiditis will not be the answer to this question. And iodine deficiency is uh, rare in developed countries and uh, it leads to non-tender goiter due to low thyroxin and high thyroid stimulating hormone levels. Because of not, not mentioning of any of this, even iodine deficiency will not be there appropriate answer to this question. So answer to this question will be Hashimoto thyroiditis only. Now this slide is an overview of four different types of thyroiditis. First being the subacute thyroiditis, then Hashimoto, superative, riddle and then the postpartum. So in the subacute the cause of this is mainly viral. Hashimoto it is autoimmune, superative most commonly the bacterial infection and then the other infection can also lead to superative thyroiditis. Riddle is due to fibrosis and it is very rare. Then postpartum is due to lymphocytic infiltration and it is up to 10% of pregnancies. That is they mean to say that they are found in up to 10% of pregnant women. Then uh, clinical findings for subacute thyroiditis include hyper then hypothyroid case, tender thyroid, large thyroid with fever. Then Hashimoto it is hypothyroid, painless, maybe presence or absence of goiter. Then superative there is fever, neck pain and the tender thyroid gland. Then in riddle there is compressive symptoms. Strider and SVC syndrome. SVC syndrome is a superior vena cava syndrome that is uh, due to either partial or complete obstruction of blood flow through the superior vena cava and this is mainly due to compression that is caused by the thyroid gland in the case of riddle thyroiditis. In postpartum thyroiditis the clinical findings include small non-tender thyroid. Now the te test for the subacute thyroiditis, the high ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation date demonstrates the case of subacute thyroiditis. Also there will be no thyroid antibodies present and low radioactive iodine uptake. Then in Hashimoto's, the 95% will present with antibodies against thyroid peroxidase. TPO actually stands for thyroid peroxidase. So 95% of patients will have positive TPO antibodies. Then in superative thyroiditis where there will be normal TFTs. That is there will be normal thyroid function test and there will be no uptake on radioactive iodine and, uh, imaging. And there will be positive culture of any bacteria or if there is a uh, viral infection which have led to thyroiditis so there would be the positive culture of them and uh, in diddle thyroiditis 67% of patient presents with positive 
antibodies. In postpartum thyroiditis, there can be hyper or hypothyroid antibodies. Uh, sorry, there is hyper or hypothyroid condition with antibodies often positive and there will be low radioactive iodine uptake. Treatment for cervical thyroiditis include NSAIDs, acetaminophen with or without steroids. Then in Hashimoto, we have levothyroxine. Uh, this is mainly just for replacement. Then superative antibiotics and drainage. Riddle, we have surgery because if they lead to compression of trachea and recurrent laryngeal nerve, then it becomes vital for the surgery. And postpartum, there is no treatment because it is a self-limiting thyroiditis. In this question, a 24-year-old woman presents to her primary care physician with a one-month history of weight loss, heart palpitations, jitteriness, and sweatiness. She also feels a pulling sensation in her groin. Her mother recently had a thyroid doctomy after experiencing similar symptoms. Temperature is 38 degrees Celsius, pulse is 110 per minute, and respirations are 24 per minute. Her thyroid gland and ocular movement examinations are normal. Pelvic examination reveals a non-tender 9cm mass. Laboratory studies show a thyroid stimulating hormone level of 0.3 micro unit per ml and thyroxine of 22 microgram per deciliter and serum beta human chorionic gonadotropin is not detected. Biopsy of the mass is shown. These findings are most consistent with which of the following. Pause the video and think of the answer. In this patient, the pelvic mass and the concurrent symptoms of hyperthyroidism like tachycardia, weight loss and palpitations are consistent with stroma ovary which is a thyroid hormone secreting ovarian teratoma. This answer is also supported by high serum thyroxine, thyroxine level and low thyroid stimulating hormone level. The thyroxine level ranges from 5 to 12 microgram per deciliter whereas the thyroid stimulating hormone ranges from 0.4 to 4 micro unit per ml. So this all suggests in total that this is the finding for stroma ovary which is a thyroid hormone secreting ovarian teratoma that presents with hyperthyroidism like tachycardia, weight loss, heat intolerance and also it also presents with mass in the pelvis. In this case, a 48-year-old woman comes to the physician complaining of an enlarging painless neck mass. She first noticed the mass three weeks ago and reports that it has gotten progressively larger over time. The patient has also gained 10 pounds in the last six weeks and frequently has to wear a sweater when taking a walk in the park even on hot days. She has not experienced any night sweats or fevers. Temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Pulse is 52 per minute. Blood pressure is 124 per 88 mmHg and BMI is 20, 27 kg per meter square. Palpitation of the neck reveals a fixed hard painless goiter. There is delayed tendon reflex relaxation in the lower extremities. A biopsy of the mass is performed which shows compression of follicles by extensive dense fibrous tissue. Laboratory studies are done and show the following. ESR is 6 mm per hour. TSH is 7.1 micro unit per ml. And there is negative antithyroid peroxidase and antithyroglobulin antibody. If left untreated, which of the following is likely to be seen in this patient? Pause the video and think of the answer. Now, in this case, the patient is presenting with signs of hypothyroidism as the patient is feeling cold even on hot days and also the patient has gained weight as well as there is an enlarging um, neck mass that is uh, fixed, hard and painless. So, there is fixed, hard, painless goiter. Taking into consideration the biopsy findings showing dense fibrous tissue, this all suggests that the patient likely has riddle thyroiditis, which is also known as invasive fibrous thyroiditis. Now, the riddle thyroiditis typically 
presents as a slowly enlarging neck mass that can compress nearby structures resulting the resulting in dysphagia dyspnea and hoarseness so if left untreated the radial thyroiditis will lead to dysphagia from esophageal compression so the answer will be c now in this question a 31 year old man comes to the physician complaining of neck pain for the past week the pain is located mainly in the neck but states that it travels to the jaw at times he experienced episodes of palpitations and anxiety attacks for several weeks which resolved spontaneously one week ago past medical history is significant for crohn's disease which is well managed with diet the patient's father had thyroid cancer at the age of 77 temperature is 37.0 degree celsius pulse is 82 per minute blood pressure is 124 per 88 mmhg and bmi is 20 kg per meter square palpitation of the neck causes severe pain for the patient the thyroid gland is asymmetrically enlarged laboratory studies shows the following where esr is 46 mm per hour tsh is 6.8 micro unit per ml and there is negative anti thyroid peroxidase and anti thyroglobulin antibody a biopsy of the thyroid gland is performed and shows diffuse infiltration with lymphocytes and giant cells forming non cissating granulomas as well as disruption and collapse of thyroid follicles further evaluation of this patient will most likely reveal which of the following pause the video and think of the answer now this patient had a previous episode of hyperthyroidism example palpitations anxiety attacks followed by an extremely tender neck mass elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate and uh, the signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism plus the biopsy findings showing granulomatous inflammation all this reveals that this findings are suggestive of subacute granulomatous thyroiditis or decurvin thyroiditis so decurvin thyroiditis is an inflammatory condition that occurs after a viral infection thus the further evaluation of this patient will most likely reveal a recent viral infection the answer will be b the next three questions are for you all to solve please to comment your answers in the comment section below in this question a 29 year old woman presents to her obstetrician gynecologist because of a four month history of amenorrhea she also reports anxiety weight loss and feeling hot all the time she takes several non prescribed health food supplements and herbs physical examination reveals 3 plus patellar reflexes and bilateral skin thickening over the shins a urine dipstick test rules out pregnancy which of the following is most likely responsible for this patient's condition please to comment your answer in the next question a 25 year old woman comes to the office because of diarrhea weight loss and palpitations for a month she says the palpitations occur when she feels stressed and that she has also been sweating more than usual examination shows a diffusely swollen thyroid gland and bilateral exophthalmos which of the following is the most likely diagnosis and what are the expected levels of trh tsh and t3 or t4 please do comment your answer in this last question a 20 day old male newborn is brought to the pediatrician due to poor feeding for the past several weeks the mother had minimal prenatal care and delivered the baby at home she had no complications during the pregnancy and took daily prenatal vitamins the patient is at the 95th percentile for head circumference 40 45th percentile for length and 50th percentile for weight vital signs are within normal limits physical examination reveals a mildly enlarged mass on the neck and that is non tender to palpation there is mild scleral ichthyosis and 
yellowing of the skin. Fundoscopic examination of the eyes reveal no abnormalities. The tongue is enlarged and protruding from the mouth. The abdomen is mildly distended with a reducible soft protruding mass at the umbilicus. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's condition? Please do comment your precious answer in the comment section. Thanks for watching. If you all like to have such clinical scenario discussions, please comment below in the comment section and I will make separate QBank sections. And if you enjoyed this video, please do like, share and subscribe.